he knew who would win. And he was right. Hmm. What else have we here? Lost Legends. Yes. This could be quite interesting. Let's have a look. By Talskar the Elder, Archivist of Winterhold. The history of Skyrim is vast, predating even the most ancient records of man and myrrh. Much has been lost, fallen to the ravages of war or the turning of the ages. But nothing is ever truly forgotten. Where no records exist, legends and folk tales offer us a key to the past. A way to piece together truths half remembered in the minds of the men. For generations the people of Morthal have told whisper tales of the Pale Lady, a ghostly woman who wanders the northern marshes forever seeking her lost daughter. Some say she steals children who wander astray. Others say that her sobbing wail strikes dead all who hear it. But behind these tales might lie a kernel of truth. For ancient records speak of Almriel, a mysterious figure Yskramor's heirs battled for decades and finally sealed away. Reachmen tell the story of Faulon, Red Eagle, an ancient king who rallied his people and drove back the armies of Cyrodiil with a flaming sword. Though accounts vary, they seem to be based on an underlying truth. The Imperial Chronicles of Empress Hestra mention a rebel leader of that era who was eventually cornered and slain in battle at the cost of a full legion of men. But some tales prove harder to analyze. Among scholars, perhaps the best known is the Forbidden Legend of the Archmage Galdir. In the dawning ages of the First Era, the story goes, there lived a powerful wizard by the name of Galdir. Wise and just, he was well known in the courts of the King Harald and all the Jarls of Skyrim, and his aid and counsel were sought by man and myrrh alike. And then he was murdered. Some say one of his sons killed him. Others that King Harl, jealous of his power, gave the order. But Galdir's three sons fled into the night, pursued by a company of Harald, Harald's best warriors and Lord German, the king's personal battle mage. A great chase ensued from the wilds of the Reach into the glacial north. One brother said to have perished in the ruins of Falgunther at the foot of Solitude. The others were run to ground soon thereafter. And once it was done, King Harald ordered every record of their murders destroyed, and Galdr's name and deeds were struck from the rolls of history. Even today few sources remain, and no bard will tell the tale, but perhaps the truth yet remains in some ancient ruin waiting to be unearthed, for nothing is truly forgotten. Well, Brandar does not know this tale, but it is uh, an interesting thing to ponder over, that is for sure. Ah, I shall keep an eye out. That is, that is uh, something that, that you can rest assuredly on. Let's see, how about Armor's Challenge? I do enjoy a book of challenges. This might be quite nice as well. By Mimophonis. Mimophonis. I apologize for mispronouncing the name. You should just call yourself anonymous for short. <laughs> Ah, 300 years ago, when Katharia became Empress, the first and only Dunmer to rule over all of Tamriel, she faced opposition from the Imperial Council. Even though she convinced them that she would be the best regent to rule the Empire while her husband Pelagius sought treatment for his madness, there was still conflict, in particular from the Duke of Vengetto, Thane Mulgemeyer who took a particular delight in exposing all of the Empress's lack of practical knowledge. In this particular instance, Kateri and the Council were discussing the unrest in Black Marsh and the massacre of Imperial troops outside the village of Armanias. The sodden swampland and the sweltering climate, particularly in summertide, would endanger the troops if they wore their usual armor. I know a very clever armorer, said Kateria. His name is Hazadir, an Argonian who knows the environments our army will be facing. I knew him in Vivek, where he was a slave to the Master Armor there, before he moved to the Imperial City as a freed man. We should have him design the armor, and weaponry, for our campaign." Mulgemeyer gave a short, barking laugh. She wants a slave to design the armor and weaponry for our troops. Sirolus Sackis is the finest armor in the Imperial City. Everyone knows that. After much debate, it was finally decided to have both armors contend for the commission. 
The council also elected two champions of equal power and prowess, Nanor Bered and Raphaelas Yule, to battle using the arms and armaments of the real competitors in the struggle. Whichever champion won, the armor, armor who had supplied him would earn the Imperial Commission. It was decided that Bered would be outfitted by Hazadir and Yule by Sarkas. The fight was scheduled to commence in seven days. Sorola Sarkas began work immediately. He would have preferred more time, but he recognized the nature of the test. The situation in Armanias was urgent. The Empire had to select their armor quickly, and once selected, the preferred armor had to act swiftly and produce the finest armor and weaponry for the Imperial Army in the Black Marsh. It wasn't just the best armor they were looking for, it was also the most efficient. Sakis had only begun steering the half-inch strips of black virgin oak to bend into bands for the flanges of the armor joint when there was a knock at his door. His assistant Fandias ushered in a visitor. It was a tall reptilian of common markings, a dull green fringed hood, bright black eyes, and a dull brown cloak. It was Hazardir, Kat Kataria's preferred armor. I wanted to wish you luck on the... Uh, is that ebony? It was indeed. Sakis had so fought, sought the finest quality ebony weave available in the Imperial City as soon as he heard of the competition and had already begun the process of smelting it. Normally it was a six-month procedure refining the ore, but he had hoped that a massive convection oven stoked by white-hot flames born of magicka would shorten the operation to three days. Sakis pointed out that the other advancements in his armory, the acidic lime pools to sharpen the blade of the Dai Katana to an unimaginable degree of prowess, the Akaviri forge and tongs he would use to fold the ebony back and forth upon itself. Hazardir did nothing but laugh. Have you been to my armory? It's two tiny smoke-filled rooms. The front's in the shop, and the back is filled with broken armor, some hammers, and a forge. That's it. That's your competition for the million of gold pieces in Imperial Commission. I trust the Empress has some reason to trust you to outfit her troops, said Sirola Sarkis kindly. He had, after all, seen the shop, and knew what Hazadir said was true. It was a pathetic workshop in the slums, fit only for the lowliest of adventurers to get their iron dagons and curiouses repaired. Sakis had decided to make the best quality regardless of the inferiority of his rival. It was his way and how he became the best armor in the Imperial City. Out of kindness, and more than a bit of pride, Sakis showed Hazadir how, by contrast, things should be done in a real professional armory. The Argonian acted as an apprentice to Sarkis, helping him refine the ebony ore and to pound it and fold it when it cooled. Over the next several days, they worked together to create a beautiful daikatana, with an edge honed sharp enough to trim a mosquito's eyebrows, enchanted with flames along its legs by one of the Imperial Battle Mages, as well as a suit of armor, bound wood, leather, silver, and ebony, to resist the winds of oblivion. On the day of the battle, Sarkis, Hazadir, and Fandias finished polishing the armor and brought in Raphael's Yule for, fi for fitting. Hazadir left only then, realizing that Nan or Bered would be at his shop shortly to be outfitted. The two warriors met before the Emperor, Empress, and Imperial Council in the arena, which had been flooded slightly to simulate the swampy conditions of the Black Marsh. From the moment Sarkis saw Yule in his suit of heavy battle armor and a blazing daikatana, and Bared in his collection of dusty, rusted lizard scales and spear from Hazadil's shop. He knew who would win, and he was right. The first blow from the daikatana lodged in Bared's soft shield as there was no metal trim to defect it. Deflect it, rather. Before Yule could pull his sword back, Bared let go of the now flaming shield still stuck on the sword and poked at the joints of Yule's ebony armor with his spear. Yule finally retrieved his sword from the ruined shield and slashed at Bared, but his light armor was scaled and angled and the attacks rolled off into the water, extinguishing the Daikatana's flames. When Bared struck at Yule's feet, he fell into the churned mud and was unable to move. The Empress, out of mercy, called a victor. Hazadir re received the commission, and thanks to his knowledge of Argonian battle tactics and weaponry, and how best to combat them, he designed the implements of war that brought down the insurrection in Armanias. Kataria won the respect of the council, and even grudgingly, that of the famed Mulgelmeyer. 
Sirole Sakis went to Morrowin to learn what Hazadir had learned there, and was never heard from again. Sometimes the best in quality can't add do good tactics. I think uh, Brandar has talked a bit about that before, yes? Ah, our final book. What should it be? I think words and philosophy would be quite nice. Immortal blood? Or do I have two of these? Out, out. Yes, words and philosophy. Let, let us leave with some uh, inspiring words, shall we? By Lady Benock. Wonderful. Lady Elena Benock, former master of the Valenwood Fighters Guild and head of the Emperor's personal guard in the Imperial City, has been leading a campaign to reacquaint soldiers of Tamriel with the sword. I met with her on three different occasions for the purposes of this book. This, the, ta the first time was at her suite in the palace, on the balcony overlooking the gardens below. I was early for the interview, which had taken me nearly six months to arrange, but she gently chided me for not being even earlier. I've had time to put up my defenses now, she said, her bright green eyes smiling. Lady Benock is a Bosmer, a wood elf, and like her ancestors, took to the bow in her early years. She excelled at the sport, and by the age of 14 she had joined the hunting party of her tribe as a Yagspur, a long-distance shooter. During the Black Year of 396, 396, when the Parki tribe began their rampage through southeastern Valenwood with the aid of powers from the Somerset Isle, Lady Benock fought the feudal battle to keep her tribe's land. I killed someone for the first time when I was 16, she says now. I don't remember it well. He, he or she was just a blur on the horizon where I aimed my bow. It meant to me no more than shooting animals. I probably killed a hundred people like that during the summer and the fall. I didn't really feel like a killer until that wintertide, when I learned what it was like to look into a man's eyes as he spilled his blood. I was a scout from the Parky tribe who surprised me while I was on camp watch. We surprised each other, I suppose. I had my bow at my side and I just panicked, trying to string an arrow when he was half a yard away from me. It was the only thing I knew to do. Of course, he struck first with his blade, and I just fell back in shock. You always remember the mistakes of your first victim. His mistake was assuming that because he had drawn blood and I had fallen that I was dead. I rushed at him the moment he turned from me, toward the sleeping camp of, his, of tri my tribesmen. He was caught off guard, and I wrested his blade away from him. I don't know how many times I stabbed at him. By the time I stopped, when the next watch came to relieve me, my arms were black and blue with strain, and there was not a solid piece of him left. I had literally cut him into pieces. You see... I had no concept of how to fight, or even how much it took to kill a man. Lady Bannock, aware of this deficiency in her education, began teaching herself swordsmanship at once. You can't learn how to use a sword in Valenwood, she says. Which isn't to say Bosmer can't use blades, but we're largely self-taught. As much as it hurt when my tribe found itself homeless, pushed to the north, it did have one good aspect. It afforded me the opportunity to meet the Red Guards. Studying all manners of weapon-wielding under the tutelage of Wardayakur, Lady Benock excelled. She became a freelance adventurer traveling through the wilds of southern Hammerfell and northern Valenwood, protecting caravans and visiting dignitaries from the various dangers indigenous to the population. Unfortunately, before we were able to pursue her story of her early years any further, Lady Benock was called away on urgent summons from the Emperor which is often the case with Imperial Guard, and in these troubled times perhaps more so than in the past. When I tried to contact her for another talk, her servants informed me that their mistress was in Skyrim. Another month passed, and when I visited her suite I was told she was in High Rock. To her credit, Lady Bannock actually sought me out for our second interview on, seconds, on sun's dusk of that year. I was in the tavern in the city called the Blood and Rooster when I felt her hand upon my shoulder. She sat down at the root table and continued her tale as if she had never been interrupted. She returned to the theme of her days as an adventurer, and told me about the first time she had ever felt confident with a sword. I owed at that time an enchanted daikatana, quite a good one, of Daedric metal. It wasn't an original Akaviri, not even of design. I didn't have that kind of money, but it served my primary purpose of delivering as much damage with as little effort as possible on my part. Akora taught me how to fence, but 
When faced with a life or death situation, I always fell back on the old overhand wallop. A pack of orcs had stolen some gold from a local chieftain in Medatia, and I went looking for them in one of the, u one of the ubiquitous dungeons that dot the countryside in that region. There were the usual rats and giant spiders, and I was enough of a veteran by then to dispatch them with relative ease. The problem came when I found myself in a pitch black room, and all around me I heard the grunts of orcs nearby, ne moving in. I waved my sword around, me connecting with nothing, but hearing their footsteps coming even nearer. Somehow I managed to hold back my fear, and to remember the simple exercises Master Akora taught me. I listened, stepped sideways, swung twisted, stepped forward, swung a circle, turned around, sidestepped, swung. My instinct was right. The orcs had gathered in a circle around me, and when I found a light, I saw that they were all dead. That's when I focused on my study of swordplay. I'm stupid enough to require a near-death experience to see the practical purposes, you see. Lady Benlock spent the remainder of the interview responding in her typically blunt way to the veracity of various myths that surrounded her and her career. It was true that she had become the master of the Valenwood Fighters Guild after winning a deal with the for a duel with the former master, who was a stooge of the Imperial Battle Mage, the traitor Jaegar Farn. But it was not true that she was the one responsible for the Valenwood Guild's disintegration two years later. She said, actually the membership in the Valenwood chapter was healthy, but in Tamriel overall the mood was not conducive to the continued existence of a non-partisan organization of freelance warriors. It was true that she became the first that she first came to the Emperor's attention when she defended Queen Akathiri of Sentinel from a Breton assassin. It was not true that the assassin was hired by someone in the High Court of Daggerfall. At least, she said wryly, that's never been proven. It was also true that she married her former servant Urkin after he had been in her service for eleven years. No one knows how to keep my weaponry honed like he does, she says. It's a practical business. I either had to give him a raise or marry him. <laughs> the only story I asked her that she would neither admit nor refute was the one about Calaxis, the Emperor's bastard. When I brought up the name she shrugged, professing no knowledge of the affair. I pressed on with the details of the story. Calaxis, though not in line for the succession, had been given the Archbishopric of the One, a powerful position in the Imperial City and indeed all over Tamriel, where that religion is honored. Whispering began immediately that Calaxis believed that the gods were angered with the secular governments of Tamriel, and the Emperor specifically. It was said that Calaxis advocated full-scale rebellion to establish a theocracy over the Empire. It is certainly true, I pressed on, that the Emperor's relationship with Calaxis had become very stormy, and that legislation had been passed to limit the Church's authority. That is, up until the moment where Calaxis disappeared, suddenly, without notice to even his closest friends. Many said that Lady Bannock and the Imperial Guard assassinated the Archbishop of Calaxis in the sacristy of his church. The date usually given was 29 of Sun's Dusk, 3rd Era, 498. Of course, responds Lady Bannock with one of her mysterious grins. I don't need to tell you that the Imperial Guard's position as protectors of the throne, not assassins. But surely no one's more trusted than the Guard for such a sensitive operation, I say carefully. Lady Benlock acknowledges that, but merely says that such details of her duties must remain secret as a matter of Imperial security. Unfortunately, her ladyship had to leave early the next morning as the Emperor had business down south, of course. I couldn't be told more specifics. She promised to send word when she could, when she returned so we could continue our interview. As it turned out, I had business of my own in the Somerset Isle, compiling a book on the Siege Order. It was therefore with surprise that I met her ladyship three months later in First Hold. We managed to get away from our respective duties to complete our third and final interview on a walk along the Decito, the great river that passes through the royal parks of the city. Steering away from questions of her recent duties and assignment, which I guessed rightly she was loath to answer, I returned to the subject of her sword fighting. Friend our hunting, she says, lists 38 grips, 750 off offensive and 1800 defensive positions, and nearly 9000 moves essential to sword mastery. The average hack and slasher knows one grip, which he uses primarily to keep from dropping his blade, 
He knows one offensive position facing his target and one defensive position fleeing. Of the multitudinous rhythms and inflections of combat, he knows less than one. The ways of the warrior were never meant to be the easiest path. The archetype of the idiot fighter is as solidly ingrained as that of the brilliant wizard and the shrewd thief, but it was not always so. The figure of the philosopher swordsman, the blade-wielding artist, are creatures of the past, together with the sword singer of Red the Red Guards, who was said to be able to wield his blade with but the power of his mind. The future of the intelligent blade wielder looks bleak in comparison to the glories of the past. Not wanting to end our interview on a sour note, I pressed Lady Elena Benach for advice for young sword swingers just beginning their careers. When confronted with a wizard, she says, throwing petals of cantilief into the decito, close the distance and hit him hard. And, uh, that is largely what Brandar does once he is spotted by the wizards. Ah, but yes, the wizards and the swordsmen, always at each other's throats, huh? Quite an interesting story. I hope to meet this Elena Benak one day. Not fond of the Bosmer, but she seems to be one of the good ones, huh? <laughs> ah, and quite a book. One, two, three, four. Goodbye, goodbye, see you again. Goodbye, goodbye, see you again.